Well, in the many years I've known this man, I've never had to introduce him formally, let alone interview him. So this is a terrifying experience. But in case there are those who are relatively new to Tom Wright, and by the way, he's Tom Wright in the UK, N.T. Wright in this country, but he is the same person in both. <laughs> so in case you think there was a brother thing going on there. Tom was educated in Oxford, largely. Oxford's a, a little town west of Cambridge. And, <laughs> <clears throat> I first heard of him when he was chaplain at Downing College, Cambridge, and one of my fellow students at Ridley Hall, as I was then, said, you've got to go and hear this chap, Tom. So I sneaked in the back of a lecture uh, of Tom Wright, which was just absolutely superb. We both had a little more hair in those days. Um, he served as assistant professor of New Testament studies at McGill University, chaplain, fellow and tutor at Worcester College, uh, as well as lecturing in the, in the university there. Dean of Lichfield Cathedral, Canon Theologian of Westminster Abbey. That's very important because, if, I hope this is okay, I see Tom primarily as a pastor who's exercising his care for people in an academic context, among others. And of course, that's confirmed because he was Anglican Bishop of Durham, the other Durham, 2003 <laughs> to 2010. He became then research professor of New Testament and early Christianity at St. Mary's College in the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. He is well known, of course, here as a prolific author. I once emailed him to say that I was very concerned for his health because at the local Christian bookshop, they hadn't had a book, a new book from him for five days. And, <laughs> and they were asking me whether he was okay. <laughs> Tom, you've got to preach later. You flew in yesterday, and I know you're flowing at the subject. So thank you for giving your time. Thank you. Um, for us. We do appreciate that. And for your words last night, absolutely, absolutely to the point. We're going to chat for a little bit and then throw it open for questions. Um, let's, let's start with a the, with the general thing. What might be less well known about you is your knowledge of, enthusiasm for the arts. When did that start? So could you say something about your early life and... I know you play various instruments and so forth. Tell us about all that. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for the invitation and the chance to be here. Um, I've always enjoyed coming to Duke, and it's good to be back. Um, I, I grew up in a kind of unostentatious musical family, like it was an unostentatious Anglican family. You know, it's kind of understated, typical British 1950s. You didn't make too much of a fuss about things. But there was a piano, and we were encouraged to find our way into it. And, and my sister and I had lessons um, and so on. And uh, uh, I, at the age of seven, <clears throat> I had a choice with either joining the Boy Scouts or joining the church choir. Uh, I couldn't do both because it was the same night of the week, the rehearsals for the, the Scouts meeting. And I remember unhesitatingly choosing the choir and uh, then being very glad that I had. I mean, being in the Boy Scouts would have been fun as well, but I kind of learned to read music just by being in the choir from the age of seven and uh, I, I don't think anyone ever taught me how it worked, but by the time I was eight or nine, I, I could read the line that I was singing and so on and figure out what was going on elsewhere, and then with piano lessons and so on. And uh, <clears throat> this was, of course, late 50s, early 60s we're talking about then, um, and all sorts of things were going on musically. Um, the move from skiffle to rock, whatever, in the, upon the popular field, and lots of my contemporaries were grabbing these funny things called guitars, and there was somebody called Elvis Presley in this country, and there's somebody called Cliff Richard in, uh, in the UK. It really dates one, doesn't it, to think this, this is, this is pre-Beatles. Um, and uh, uh, so I, like uh, certain others I know in this room, just found my way into playing a guitar. And, right. um, and then when I, was, um, when I was about 12 or 13, somebody pointed out that what I was doing with the guitar, i.e. playing chords and then singing a melody, it's dead easy to do the same thing in the piano, where, where chords in the left and a tune in the right. Um, and so I then started playing jazz, which um, then opened up other things. But So all that was kind of going on while everything else was going and on. And reading and poetry, literature? You... Um, yeah, I, I read, I was well taught um, literature when I was um, in what we call in Britain a prep school. That was sort of ages 
um, 8 to 13. So we'd done a lot of Shakespeare and done chunks of Milton and goodness knows what and be made to learn it and I've still got some of that. You know, what you learn when you're 11, 12, 13 you probably have for life. Um, whereas now if I try to learn a poem, um, oh my goodness, uh, the only way I can retain it is if I instantly use it in all the next five lectures I do and then that's, <laughs> that somehow sort of welds it in there. I was not well taught English um, in my teens, I just happened to get the wrong English teachers at the school that I was at and I was doing classics as a main thing. But I came in backwards, as it were, into the great English poetry through singing. Uh, my singing teacher gave me um, uh, wonderful things to sing, including, I mentioned to you before, George Herbert's five mystical songs, uh, Vaughan Williams' setting of Herbert's five poems, those, those ones. And I remember thinking, who is this man? Why have I not heard about him? And then that was for me the beginning of, oh, I see, there's all that stuff going on in the early 17th century and just finding my way from there, really. A lot of your writing is very metaphorically rich. I'm sure you've had that said to you before, that, that you seem to have extraordinary ways of, of coining the right image or whatever, and then not just jumping away from it, but allowing it to do its work. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm not quite sure how that happens. It just, if, if it occurs, it occurs. It just um, happens, yeah. And, and I think certainly sometimes it's been conscious. I know when I was writing the big book on Paul, uh, I, I had to make decisions about what the leitmotif for this or that chapter was going to be. And then it was kind of fun to explore um, what you could do with that and where that would go. And uh, Michal, who's over there, kindly donated me three of his amazing poems, um, which then supplied me with a stock of metaphors for the bits of the book. Terrific. That they, and that, that was such a wonderful experience. But yes, I, <clears throat> I've often tried to to find an image and then explore it and live within it and use it as a controlling metaphor. And, and that's, maybe that's just to keep one from being bored by one's own academic tasks. You know, that there's something else going on. There are different registers that are happening at the same time. Incredibly important. Though. <clears throat> You're coming in at the end of a conference on theology and the arts. Um, the kind of guiding theme has been new creation. Yeah. Um, Judith Wolfe had a wonderful image of, from creation to new creation as a kind of dome of, of the Christian world. Could you say something about that? from a New Testament perspective, I think John's Gospel, 2 Corinthians 5, the, the kind of classic <laughs> things. And I know you will be later, yeah, but yeah, I, no problem with repetition. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> I don't know if everyone feels like this, but I, I, I hate repeating myself, so I will, whatever I say now that borrows from this morning's sermon, I will try not to say in the sermon, as some of us were thinking earlier. So uh, you can sort of feel that as a running head over some of this. Um, <clears throat> I think in much of the tradition of New Testament studies that um, I and others grew up in, new creation wasn't a major theme because particularly within the dominant Lutheran paradigm that was ruling the roost from Germany in the 19th and early 20th century, new creation just didn't seem to feature. It was more something you might find in Reformed theology, which wasn't so powerful within New Testament interpretation. So the image was how to be saved and the implication being to be saved from creation um, rather than a salvation which is, which is um, embracing and redeeming creation. Um, and so for me, that's, that's sort of come in gradually bit by bit. And particularly when, I guess when I was at Litchfield, I started doing some serious work on the resurrection and on the meaning of resurrection in the New Testament and early Christianity and realizing that a lot of the tradition that I'd grown up in was basically platonic um, and that it was time to repent of this. Um, and I've said uh, again and again to students now, if you want to go to the, new, to the first century and find somebody teaching that we humans have things <clears throat> called souls which are exiled from their true home in heaven and that we're looking forward to going back there, the person you're after is Plutarch, not Paul. Plutarch, who's a middle Platonist, who's a priest, a pagan priest at Delphi, one of the most educated and erudite people of his day, and he was that kind of a guy. And when I first read that treatise of Plutarch, I thought, that's funny because that's actually what most of my Western Christian friends think the Christian gospel is. But of course, that isn't what the New Testament is about. And so... Um, what was the big turnaround? Because I remember an autobiographical essay Ah. You talked about Colossians 1 as a Yeah, yeah. Well, that was strange. In the 1980s, I was in McGill, as you said, and I was commissioned to do the new Tyndale commentary on Colossians. And so I thought, wow, this was exciting. I was only just 30 and this was a great chance, etc. And I started writing on Colossians. 
and I got to the great poem in Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Um, and I got stuck, and I read the commentaries, and I couldn't quite see how it all worked. And it's particularly about um, Jesus Christ as not only the one through whom all things were created in heaven, on earth, etc., but through whom all things are redeemed. And I think that's because my theology in, say, 1981, just didn't have any space for that idea of all things being redeemed. I think I was still firmly in a dualistic paradigm. So I put that commentary aside. I uh, had plenty of other things to do. We had four small children. I was starting out as a university lecturer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, I worried about it, and I prayed about it, and so on. And all sorts of things happened in my life, upside down, inside out, some, some quite exciting and some also quite difficult um, times. And then about two, two and a half years later, maybe 1983, four, I came back to it. because I've got to finish this thing. They, they gave me a contract. I'd better get it done. Plus, I needed as a young scholar to get some stuff published, for goodness sake. Um, and I remember being nervous as I got towards Colossians 1, 15 through 20, because I thought, what's going to happen? Um, what am I going to do with this bit that I didn't understand? And the extraordinary thing was that I couldn't understand what it was I hadn't understood, because it all made sense. So somewhere... <laughs> Somewhere in the dark recesses of my psyche between 1981 and 1983, um, something had shifted, uh, a kind of a balance of power. And uh, I wouldn't try to do the auto-psychoanalysis that goes with that. Um, maybe it's because uh, in the autumn of 1983, I made one of my lifetime friends, namely Richard Hayes. We met at SBL in 1983. So maybe that had something to do with it. But anyway, by, seriously, by 1984, I remember I was fully on board with the idea that in Christ, the cosmos is redeemed. And it doesn't make me a universalist. People say, oh, if, if everything's redeemed, surely that means you're a universalist. No, I've, I've never been a universalist. And that remains a puzzle, and I think it's part of, of the larger puzzle of all sorts of things to do with um, sin and death and so on. One of the things you've pioneered is, well, not pioneered, but at least brought out is a reading of John's gospel along these lines, yeah. where the creation, new creation thing is often at least in my experience, not talked about at all. Yes, uh, that now seems to me totally bizarre that people can read John and not see that. You know, that John 1 is so obviously uh, a deliberate echo of Genesis 1 and 2, and then John 20, which I'll be speaking about later, um, I think is so obviously a reprise of John 1 in new creation mode. And um, the eighth day motif that um, John, um, I think it was... Peter Brook, the Shakespeare director, who said that by now Shakespeare did nothing by accident. You know, and like a John, do, John does nothing by accident. So when you get um, on the first day of the week very early, and the translations don't always bring this out, but that's how John 20 begins, um, on the first day of the week. And then in case you missed it, verse 19, the evening of that day, the first day of the week. And John has been clear to mark the days up to that, so that on the Friday, which is the sixth day of creation, um, the day when humans are created in God's image, Pontius Pilate brings Jesus out to the crowd and says, behold the man, ecce homo, this is the human being. And we know that that's coming if we've read John 1.14 because the word became flesh corresponds to the image in Genesis yeah. 1. Um, and then on the seventh day, and you know where this is going for me, the seventh day, which is the Saturday, on the seventh day God rested in the darkness of the tomb. And then on the first day of the week, very early, Mary Mag. So I just think it's all there. Um, and of course, we've read John in so many ways, pietistically, evangelistically, fine, let's do it, that's all there. But this great creation, new creation structure is just so massive. Temple into that? Absolutely, temple into that. Um, chapter five of this beast here. This is um, <laughs> Tom's latest book. I'm glad he's not slacking. <clears throat> uh, this, these are the Gifford lectures uh, given, and which, which Scottish university were these in? Aberdeen. Aberdeen, that's it, yeah, Aberdeen. Um, History and eschatology, Jesus and the promise of natural theology. A lot of agony has gone into yep. this, from, from what you were saying. And we even had a kind of mini conference on it when we were yeah. responding to, to uh, he, he risked giving us all early drafts of this. So um, it's not yet for sale. There's a great thing here saying not for sale. I don't know what. That means we just come and genuflect before it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. There we are. Feel, f feel free to do that. I mean, Anyhow, sorry. Um, yes, temple. Just well, to be for because that's um, such a fascinating theme in all this, and it's there in Ge it, the Genesis thing. It, it, it really is, and this is this is controversial, uh, and not all Hebrew Bible scholars would agree with this. But yeah. I am 
exploring with delight over the last 10 years what a bunch of people, I mean, quite different people like John Walton at Wheaton and John Levinson at Harvard, those are two very different scholars, but they're saying loud and clear that the narrative arc from Genesis 1 and 2 to Exodus 40 is about God creating this heaven and earth construct in seven stages with an image at the heart of it, this is a temple. And it's meant to be thought of as a temple. Creation is a temple, but all sorts of things go wrong. The thing which is supposed to be bearing the image doesn't do it right, etc., etc. But that the first, well, it's not the first narrative arc, but the first big narrative arc lands you up with the tabernacle in the second half of the book of Exodus, um, where the divine glory comes to dwell, and the tabernacle is a small working model of new creation. The tabernacle is the sign, not, not as a retreat from the world into some sacred space, but the sign within the world that God is going to do the new creation anyway. And then Solomon's temple, 1 Kings 8, same thing happens. The glory comes and dwells there. And then you can tell the story of Israel. Um, I was doing this with some lectures um, further north just the last few days. Um, you can tell the story of Israel in terms of that implicit temple theology and what happens with the exile when the temple is destroyed and how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land. And then the strange promises of return, rebuilding, what sort of a rebuilding. You know, there are Jewish groups like in Qumran who are wrestling with what sort of a rebuilding are we talking about, but with the aim of Israel's God returning to the temple at last. And then I think, obviously, John, I think also obviously Mark, um, perhaps less obviously Matthew and Luke, but I think it's there, and certainly Paul are drawing on precisely that theme for the heart of, and I mean the heart of, their Christology and pneumatology. And if we do that, then all sorts of things look different from how we've normally done it. That's lovely. Well, Let's begin to explore this in relation to the arts a bit now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's the dome of creation, new creation. That could sound... A little sentimental, just put like that. Not, not your theology, but um, mm. as if mm. there's order of creation and it's going to be recreated. Yeah. But obviously, yeah. this, goes, yeah. this goes through a cross. Well, now, yeah. how does this begin to impact the way we think about the arts? Yeah. And don't worry about repeating what you might say. That's fine. Uh, it, it's, it's such a great question. And I didn't hear Judith's presentation yesterday, so I, I, I don't know how that dome works, but we can talk about that. Um, the... And the fact that there is a great Christian tradition, the, uh, the, the, the dualist tradition that is collapsing towards Platonism, that is so worried about sin and death and the destruction of everything that the only thing to say is we've got to be rescued from it. Clearly, there is a major theme there which cannot be ignored. And some people do try to ignore it. My late lamented friend, lamented friend Marcus Borg, with whom I had lots of debate on the Jesus issues in the 1990s, Marcus was basically a panentheist. And the trouble with panentheism, like pantheism, is that it cannot have a serious critique of evil. Um, because if everything is in God, then, you know, that's all right. We're basically trundling along all right. In, in my Anglican tradition recently, some of the new liturgies have picked up that line from the Book of Wisdom, chapter 1, verse 7, which says, the Spirit of God fills the whole world. And this, I've heard sermons on this, um, where people say, yes, the Spirit of God fills the whole world. Therefore, we in the church, we have to learn from all the things that are out there in the world. And I want to say, well, yes, we do have to learn from what's out there in the world. But the Book of Wisdom knows perfectly well that a lot of what's out there in the world is pretty appalling. And if the Spirit of God fills the whole world, then this isn't just a matter of, so let's just have a nice party. Then I want to say, if that's true, then what the Spirit of God is mostly doing is lamenting. Because when we look around at the world, then, okay, if the Spirit is breathing there, then the Spirit, Romans 8, is groaning in the midst of the uh, decaying and corrupting um, uh, world. And we, are, uh, part of the vocation of the Christian is to share that. And so this is where, for me, the arts really have a vocation. And I'm still trying to explore this, both in the sermon and in other things I'm doing, um, that... The, the arts have a vocation to open our eyes to be able to see and to hold onto in the presence of God, perhaps without resolving it, 
the pain of the world and the promise of new creation and to see how that actually works. And I suspect that people like you who understand the nature of harmony better than most of us would say that that's part of what's going on in harmonic sequences, perhaps. Indeed, um, very much so. How much one can have a natural theology built out of that, I don't know. That's, that's a whole other yeah, question. Yeah, but part of the danger there, I think, is, yes, I mean, of course, so much music works by creating tensions yeah. and then resolving. Not resolving, yeah. yeah. I think we, the only thing, we would be very careful of that model, not to suggest that now we can turn that into a metaphysics where, whereby yeah. God introduces evil in order to make things more interesting in the well, end. Well, and... Uh, that's, that's that, horrendous. That is, that is a problem. And actually, no, that's the problem with the God as the great composer analogy. Of it, course, it, exactly. Or God the improviser. Exactly. It's fantastic, but wow, we have to be careful. You have to be very, very careful. And evil and, is uh, an intrusion. Yeah, and the, the, the conversation I had with Ian McGilchrist a week ago in, in, oh, in did you? Uh, St. Andrews, which was, which was great fun, um, pushing him on exactly this, because he, he is basically an, is a self-confessed panentheist. Um, right. And he said, well, you know, you've got to have some, some grit in the oyster. You've got to have something to push back at, otherwise there's no good new thing going to happen. Yeah. I'm thinking, please don't go there. This yeah. is um, yeah. uh, theologically, philosophically, that's quite a difficult place to go to. But still... Um, I remember, I just started to interrupt, the Nicholas Lash saying to me once, we need to be very, very careful. We don't think of ourselves in the new creation looking back and say, now I see why the Holocaust had to happen. Oh, exactly, exactly. Now I can see where it fit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, well, this is the it thing. It fit, that's the whole I, I, I remember when I was teaching in Oxford and uh, one of the funny things you do when you're examining is you sit around a table with, with your colleagues who are setting the exams and you discuss the questions in the different papers. And one of the questions that one of the theologians had, had put on the table was, would it be immoral to try to solve the problem of evil? And that was the first time I'd actually thought into question. that. It is a great question. Mm -hmm. You can perhaps guess who it was who set that question. Yes. It was Rowan Williams. Yeah. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, but it, it made me realize exactly that point, that if you think you can say, ah, oh, yes, now we see, so evil belongs there. No, the whole point is evil is absurd. It doesn't belong. Um, and that's why I think, and I'll come back to how we do this at the arts in a minute, yeah. it's why I think the words for evil and for the dark powers, which some people misleadingly call apocalyptic powers, um, you know, like principalities and powers and archai and exousia and so on, these are imprecise words. I don't think they had precise language for it, nor do we. These are arm-waving, gesturing words because this stuff doesn't fit. It doesn't make sense, and we shouldn't expect it to make sort of sharp sense lexically either. So then the question is, how do you address a world where that is going on, musically or artistically. And, you know, Picasso's Guernica, I think, is, is doing that. And some of the great paintings which are um, a kind of um, incorporated scream of rage or despair are saying, no, we cannot just say, yeah, it's all right, really. Um, and, and, but then musically, um, I mean, obvious examples like I suppose Mars in Holst's Planets, um, where you've got that sort of sense of this is war, this doesn't mean what we want it to mean, yep. it's destructive and horrible. Um, and it's an irregular rhythm too, yeah, five, yeah. five, four, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned, uh, uh, no actually I think it was Neil McGregor who mentioned to you the Tree of Life. Oh yes, the yes. Tree of Life, which you've used a number of times, yeah, yeah. and I've used many, many times yeah, as well. Yeah. Just for those who don't know that, okay, because that says something about yeah, this. It, it really does. It, I don't know where. It, I hope it's still there in the British Museum. Um, but uh, the British Museum commissioned uh, a, a, a Tree of Life from uh, Mozambique artists after the Civil War. And I think the British Museum joined with Christian Aid to yeah. commission this. And this is an amazing structure. If it was in this room, you could put it on this stage and it would just about get up to the roof. So it's not big, it's not massive, but it's big enough to have these lovely branches and leaves and birds nesting, etc. And the entire thing is made from decommissioned weapons and from bits and pieces of old um, uh, cartridges and so on. And it, it's an... Just think, it's an extraordinary uh, way of saying artistically that yes, something absolutely terrible has happened and God can nevertheless do something radically new with it. And the tree provides then a canopy and you can come and stand under its branches and either pray or weep or whatever's appropriate. And see, see, that's the sort of thing that art can do where 
that cannot be translated into rational prose. You know, this means A plus B plus C. Yeah, you can do that if you really want to be boring on a wet Thursday afternoon. But for goodness sake, just go and stand under it and see what it does to you. I've often thought we need something like that in every church or every cathedral. Well, because well. a lot of... Uh, there's, there's a certain kind of hankering after a certain kind of art that's just instantly, yeah, instantly yeah. pleasing. You might say, oh, it doesn't even remotely. Yes, and, and I think I map that onto, and I will be saying something about this later, I map this onto the kind of rationalist versus romanticist divide that falls down one or other side of a great divide into either we're turning this into a set of ideas which we can then manipulate, or we're turning it into something which simply generates feelings in ourselves as though the feelings were the things that matter. Um, you know, C.S. Lewis has some good stuff about, um, you know, of course the feelings matter. Lewis was a very uh, you know, sure. feelings orientated guy. But um, so when you actually look in the mirror, so to speak, and see what feeling you're having when you're having this experience, then that misses the point. Yeah. Um, because you're, you're, you're asking the wrong question. And it seems to me then you get the sort of Keech art, which is only saying, um, you know, you, you're supposed to be having these feelings now, um, which is a sort of aesthetic pornography almost, just, just, just this, this oh, is yeah. a way of having certain feelings. And then, but then the rationalist says, no, 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 we can't do that. And then you get brutalism and uh, all that. Um, are there living artists, musicians, poets, painters, whatever, that you particularly admire, look at, or keep an eye on? Present company accepted. Um, <laughs> Indeed, of course, Michal. Yeah. Um, I, I, um, he was great on the cowbell last night, wasn't he? <laughs> I mean, I've, I've, I've never seen such creative use of a cowbell before. It, was, it really t took me into new sonic dimensions. That it was uh, just incredible. Oh dear. I, um, I haven't got to know his work very well, but James Macmillan, the composer, yeah, um, who actually um, helps us at St Andrews, which is which is wonderful. I was privileged. Yes, of he does. Yeah. I, I was privileged to go to the first performance of his Starbat Mater in the Barbican a couple of years ago. That was extraordinary, yeah. and the way that James has captured the imagination of the British cultural scene without losing an iota <laughs> of his deep Christian and Roman Catholic commitment and he's very upfront and, and basic about it and it comes through in his music and of course the Starbat Mater is doing precisely what I was talking about this is a lament and you can feel in every bar of the music um, the power of that lament and of that task of holding on to the pain of the world in the presence of God and that's of course what the great Starbat Mater theme from medieval um, poetry and so on is all about so, um, yeah, I, I, I'm enjoying Relating that. to that, just um, Macmillan has an amazing passage at the end of his St. John Passion. Actually, we commissioned a Luke Passion from him oh, here, and we right. did it yes, in, yes. in the chapel. And the John Passion, where after, it's really very brutal kind of music we've been having up until then. This is after the death of Jesus. Um, the orchestra plays a kind of postlude. And it's full of yearning and screeching and all sorts of stuff. And then suddenly out of this, uh, and a, a hymn of praise, which he wrote for his little congregation in Glasgow, a hymn of praise, yeah. um, while the screeching carries on. Wow. As wow. if to say, yeah. it, it's at the cross, of course, his point is sure. not re resurrection, sure. Sure. but on the cross, this is victory. Yes, you know, yes. This is, how can you d bring those together yeah. when it's so easy to see, well, it's this and then it's that. No, these are absolutely together. Yes, yes. And that does seem to me John's gospel and it is finished. Yeah, uh, and, uh, it is, that absolutely. That now is the hour and all that. You know. and, and, I, and I think the it is finished is an echo of Genesis 2, the beginning of yeah, where are, God right. finished the creation. Yeah. Um, but uh, also that John 12 thing, and I think part of the reason we may have found this difficult aesthetically may be cognate with the fact that theology has found it difficult to talk about the Christus Victor theme, um, and people have been suspicious of it, um, because we're not very good at articulating right. what these evil powers Absolutely. are that are in fact defeated on the cross. Because we're all very much aware that if you say, when Jesus died, the powers were defeated, people say, well, come on, look out of the window. It's pretty obvious that the powers are still extremely active and dangerous and nasty. And somehow, as Christians, I think we are committed, as Paul was, to saying those two things together. together. Um, exactly. you know, 
Paul writing Colossians in prison says he disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public example of them. And if people say, oh, that's so triumphalistic, it can't even be by Paul. I say, no, sorry, this is a prison letter. Um, and it, it makes sense. But so trying to say those two things, and this is, of course, where the theologian is hugely jealous of the musician because the theologian has to write in sentences which have to come sequentially. Um, but again and again, one wants, exactly. to, one wants to say, you've got to say these three things together and you've got to imagine them together, but you can't actually do that in prose. Whereas the musician, I mean, <laughs> thinking of the Jupiter Symphony from, from last night or some of those great uh, Mozart operatic moments where you get a sextet where everyone is Every, singing but their, own, their own totally different thing, but it all makes a, a complete sense. You think, wow, wish I could do that in prose. And the answer is no, that's what prose can't do. Um, so does that mean, as a theologian, a musician, I'm, I've got to be jealous of myself? Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh, if I was you, oh, I'd so be jealous I've got of you. a serious identity yes, yes, through there. I'm, <laughs> go with it. Yeah. Um, one, one other question. Then we'll throw it open for, for questions. All right. There's going to be a microphone over something over that's lovely. Um, it's a question of the poor. Um, putting on indeed something like this, or indeed any big artifact, it's it's expensive. Uh, Natalie Carnes, I know, is, is, you know, Natalie Baylor has been writing on this and indeed spoke on this earlier. Mark 14, uh, Jesus at the home of Simon the leper and couldn't, the, the, you know, the, um, the ointment, isn't it? Well, couldn't yeah, this yeah, have been yeah, sold yeah. and given to the poor? What if we say that about the arts? I mean, given the horrendous situations we're dealing with in this country, in my country and others, um, the arts just surely a luxury in the midst of all that. What's your kind of take on that? I think in the Western world, we have allowed our Western sense of detachment from the pain of the rest of the world to infect the arts, um, like we've allowed it to infect everything else. I mean, part of the thesis that I argue in this book is that the Western world has become much more than we normally realize, Epicurean in the sense of God is a long way away if he exists at all. The world just makes itself and, and therefore, <clears throat> the thing for people to do is to find a nice, comfortable place where they can be okay, <clears throat> because actually they then imitate the God who they've described, who is detached from the rest of the world. Well, so that if you want to be an ancient Epicurean, what you need is a nice villa on a hillside somewhere with compliant slaves and a decent vineyard, where you can look down at the poor benighted folk in the valley and thank your lucky stars or your genes or whatever that you are where you are. We've done that corporately in the modern Western world. This is the first time in history that Epicureanism has been more than a small minority interest. And we've been able in the Western world to do that while um, the people down the hill, as it were, are now, to change the metaphor but make it literal, washing up on our shores um, because they see what we've got and they want it. Now, it seems to me that large-scale cultural thing which has happened really since the 18th century has infected and affected the way we do the arts so that we do create elite things. But actually, if you go back, even as recent as, as, as Bach or Handel, um, they are writing world-class music, but which is stuff that people can sing and will sing. And Bach's congregations were not high elites, they were people in a local church, etc. And if you go back, of course, to Shakespeare, um, then uh, these plays are designed for anyone who rolls up to the Globe Theatre. And, 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 uh, and actually, they're educative because they will take anyone who just enjoys the jokes or the gravedigger scene or whatever, and, and then, wait a minute, there's something, something more going on here. So that it seems to me some of the greatest art in the various traditions has always been both popular and um, elevating. And if we choose to turn it into something which is purely elite, then we are allowing the cultural angst of our time, i.e. the Epicureanism, which is the cause of so many of our global problems, I would say, to affect the arts, and we have to repent of that. But that doesn't mean we don't have to do it well, we just have to be constantly aware. One of the things I've loved watching over the last few years has been the way in which, in some bits of the British tradition, there are concert halls and cathedrals and so on that are quite consciously becoming outward facing and drawing in community groups and primary school children and so on and saying, actually, this is for all of you and this is about all of you. And many, many people will come back. Thing happening in West County Durham at the moment, a very impoverished area where 
Somebody has taken over um, the running of bits of Auckland Castle where I used to live, and they've got this amazing project, the Kinron Project, which is a whole community event, um, like a Sonne Lumiere, only a historical pageant. And the whole town is involved, literally thousands of local people, doing music, doing dance, doing theatre, in a way that they'd none of them ever done before. And, and to see that actually coming out of a richly Christian desire for regeneration, hallelujah. Yeah, that's, that's, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Shakespeare, there's a lot of Shakespeare in prison, Shakespeare in jail now, I think. Absolutely, well. absolutely, yes. yes. Transformative. Okay, let's have some, let's have some questions. Uh, I'm going to have to use a microphone. Would you be good enough to walk to the microphone? There's one over there as well, I think, yeah. Is there one on the other side? I'm sorry, yes, yeah, there are yeah. two of them. Beg your pardon. Yeah. Okay. And obviously, if we can keep things fairly, fairly concise and to the point, all the better. Sorry, it's okay. I'll leave it in here. Okay. Um, so this is a personal question for both of you. Um, you're both smart, you're both clever, but what do you do to nurture your own soul and your own love of God? What spiritual practices are you currently engaging in to grow in your own faith? For, for me, it's very basic and old-fashioned and straightforward that I read the Bible and I say my prayers and I attend the Eucharist and uh, I worship with my fellow Christians and I try to share in the love of people in the communities where I live, etc. And that's like 101, you know, this is, this is obvious. But um, one of the nice things about being an Anglican is we have this, this very, very good basic liturgy which gives you a framework within which I just feel totally at home. This is what I grew up with and uh, I never seen any reason to, to stop. Um, so it's very basic. Very similar. Um, the daily office of the Church of yeah. England uh, in the morning and Compline in the yeah, evening. Exactly. Um, and immersion in my little local church, which is very undramatic. It's about 70 members. There's a, uh, a choir, which, is, which I sing in and play for, uh, which is pretty grim. The way, <laughs> the way I put it is we have unusually low standards and we invariably fail to live up to them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I love them dearly. Yeah, yeah. And... We've, we don't fight about, we play lots of musical styles, we don't fight about those things, and there's just an extraordinary spirit in the congregation. Yeah. Um, and for that, I'll always be grateful. For, so those are, the main, those are the main things. It's funny because Jeremy and I haven't had this conversation, but I too attend a little local church um, where I, at the age of 70, significantly reduce the average age of the congregation. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, but they're lovely people. And, and it's just good to be there with them week by week. And they will have been there a few hours ago. Indeed, they will. All right, thank you both so much. Um, I have a question for, I have many acquaintances um, who are, and close friends, family, who are artists and musicians, and they are doing honest, good, I think spirit-filled work that is bringing meaning and hope. But they're really discouraged because they're not making it, like, at least in a worldly sense. Of, it's not recognized as financially sustainable. It's not what you could be doing as a lawyer or an accountant. How, for you as pastors and theologians, how would you speak to them and provide a new compass through the logic of the gospel for why to continue in the artistic vocation and also, why to find it meaningful in the face of Great question. financial insustainability? Great question. Yeah. Well, uh, I expect you know more about it than I do. I, I, I grieve over that situation uh, simply to say this, this is not a new situation. You know, in every generation, um, the arts have been sustained by um, often two or three quirky patrons who decide we're going to have this person as our court composer, or we're going to give money to this artist to paint some great thing. And uh, th there is a very little trickle, there was a very little tr trickle down effect from that. But I imagine that um, for every Michelangelo who was commissioned to, to do what he did, there were probably dozens of other people in Italy at the time who were uh, struggling to make ends meet and having to do three other jobs on the side or send their children out to work or whatever. Um, and I think that's always been so. But I think it's been peculiarly so, um, again, since the 
in McGilchrist's terms, the left brain um, takeover of the Enlightenment, which says that the arts are the pretty bit around the edge, which are nice if you can afford it, but if you can't afford it, never mind, it doesn't matter. And I see this in our education policies, that um, uh, if, the, if the school budget is tight, um, the, the people who get left off at the side are the art teacher, the music teacher, the drama teacher, the, the whatever. And, and, and I think it really starts there in that the society should instead be given a sense that these are primary, these are basic. Yeah. And that's a huge social, social revolution which would have to happen. Um, every government then in the Western world, I think, faces the question how much do we as a government put into the arts, put into the building of new theatres, whatever it is. And that's, all, that's always tricky because we have this cultural imperative of, of saying, well, it's nice if you can, but, but not if you can't. Um, I don't have an easy solution for what you then do about it. But the church has in the past been a great patron of the arts. But of course, as Jeremy said, the church has got lots of other obligations as well. So I, you know, I, I very much agree with that. I think, um, speaking very practically, there are, I know there are people here who are, in effect, arts pastors, that is, members of a ministry team within the church, and really members of that team, uh, who see their, their arts as a means of, of pastoring, but also who see themselves as supporting local artists, both in the congregation and without. I think just congregations just need to learn to value, it's so obvious to say, but their artists uh, within and without the church. And I, I, that's just got to be played out. Um, but just very basic, people need to be educated how long something takes to rehearse. Um, how, how long it takes to put up something with decent lighting. I think a lot of people don't, don't realize that. Or to sustain the kind of musicians we heard last night, you know, the, you know, the professional players, how much practice they have to do a day just to keep that up. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. And I think congregations, because um, all of those are, are faithful Christians. Um, Elizabeth Osling, the fl flute player, she started a Bible study in the Boston Symphony Orchestra, which is flourishing and large. And uh, yet she, hear, she tells me she hears absolutely nothing about her work or her vocation as a player and artist in her own congregation at all. So something needs to be done about that. I don't have quick or easy answers. Others here I know have done much more work in that area. So. Thank you all. Could both of you speak about um, the link between imagination and joy? Just given our earlier conversation. And joy, sorry, can you speak up? So joy. Yes, of yep. Imagination and joy. Um, and because of what you shared, Professor Wright, about Platonism and sort of the spirit's role of filling the world through lament. Um, and so for me as a musician, you know, composer thinking about, some composers seem to gravitate toward some sort of platonic form or trying to reach beyond the, beyond the world to evoke what, uh, what is the source of our joy, but others seem more at home of lamenting. Um, or even on Friday, we talked about C.S. Lewis and um, Tolkien wrestling with whether there's one way of doing art to reflect the forms or whether imagination itself creates something. So just if you could speak to specifically the, the joy aspect to balance out the lament. Thank you so much. May I just, a, a quick comment. A thing I often have to wrestle with, not least with artists, is, the, is the, I think the false assumption that misery is more profound than joy. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I know about the dangers of sentimentality. I've written about it. I mean, I'm you know, passionate. But is this notion that if, you're, if there's joy coming through, uh, you, you, you must be superficial in, in some way. If you're going to be profound, you, you've really got to nod your head very slowly. Um, <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm getting at. Yeah, this. Yeah. That is not for a moment to trivialize. Yes. Um, speaking very personally, my brother is a, a chronic schizophrenic. Uh, has been since the age of 17. And there's been no improvement. And he'll, he'll expect, he, he probably only got about another few years to live. Um, the joy of the resurrection in that doesn't, doesn't put a soft edge around that. It says that, that the Son of God came into even that, so that even that um, can be part, can be taken into a promise of resurrection. Do I feel that every day? Of course not. Do I see it happen every day? No. But, but please don't tell me joy is is superficial at that point. Not if it's a joy that's that's had to die with Christ and rise again. Yes. 
Yes. Yes, I, I find myself coming back again and again, perhaps inevitably, to Romans chapter 8, um, where you get very sharp suffering. I and mean, people often see Romans 8 as this just great shout of triumph, and there is a shout of triumph, but there's a huge amount of, of, sh of sheer suffering in there, and the groaning of all creation, and the spirit groaning within us as we groan with the groaning of creation. And I've been thinking about that in terms of a theology of the Holy Spirit within the whole idea of um, the world designed to be the temple of the living God um, and God wanting to dwell there and God already dwelling there by the Spirit, but that dwelling taking the form of lament and then realizing something I just started to try to feel my way into, partly through one of the research students who I've been working with recently, um, that Israel in the Psalms of lament and then the church in its lament is given these gifts in order that God in the person of the Spirit may be lamenting at the heart of his creation. It's a vehicle for God's own use. So when, you know, and then when you say that, I think I see more clearly why Paul says, if we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. Because the, at the very moment when you're talking about that being the place of God's lament, you're talking about theosis, actually. Um, but, but in a very paradoxical way, in a totally non-triumphalistic way. Um, and so I, I then see that great convergence as the, the convergence of where we are in God's story at the moment against the day when there will be no more lament because there will be no more death or pain or crying. Um, and, uh, but the, the, the rich anticipation yeah, of that joy that's right. in, in the middle of that is, is enormously real and... Um, yeah, it's, it's anything but um, shallow. Of course it can become shallow, and people who want to try and grab it too easily right. or at too low a cost can trivialize it, and then people see the triviality and they think that that's all there ever was. That's a problem. Another person? This, this side? I'm an educator and I'm, my career is deeply concerned with advocacy for children. I'm very grateful for your statement on um, the concern of uh, removing arts education from, um, from schools. Um, children sing before they talk and they dance before they walk and I have a lot of curiosity if the suppression of arts education isn't about um, effectively censorship. We are afraid of spirit and we're afraid of especially children um, so much so that we, we put them in cages in this country, and yet they still draw in the dirt um, and sing in the overcrowded conditions there to express their spirit. I'm, my question is about censorship, and specifically art censorship. I'm curious about what constitutes the acceptable art, because the art that is recognized is what ultimately defines um, maybe not for all of us, but can be a representation of, um, of our Christianity. And so I, I was just, um, and this, this question came up for me as I was listening to some of the, the wonderful, amazing conversations this, this amazing weekend. Um, how do we define, how do we accept what is art, even when what others may think is their art is uncomfortable to us or doesn't precisely align with our point of view? Question. Wow, it's a great question. I don't know very much about censorship. It seems to me that all communities do in fact practice some forms of censorship. I mean, in the academic community, we have publishers readers who are anonymous and who the, read manuscripts and say, no, you can't publish this. And, and it's kind of frustrating when you're an author and you get this stuff coming back at you and think, who's making up these rules and, and, and why and how does that work? And then that works down the food chain into different, different forms that many of us in this room will know. Um, where you, know, you submit an article to a journal and they say, well, yes, but we can do this, but you'll have to add a bit about such. So I mean, this goes on all over the place. It's not just um, children and art, though I very much hear what you say there. Um, and I, I'm, uh, my mind goes straight away to one of the amazing novels by the Jewish writer Chaim Potok, um, My Name is Asher Lev, where the young Asher Lev finds himself instinctively um, painting in a way that an Orthodox Jew shouldn't be doing, and then in searching for models for the pain of his community, the only model he can find that will do the trick, spoiler alert, is the model of the crucifixion. And then his community totally reject him. He's crossed a boundary. You can't go there. Um, and yet what Potok is saying in the novel 
is that actually this is the most deeply authentic thing that a Jew in the modern world could do would be to find this crucified Jew as the image of the pain of the Jew in the world. And that's, that's a huge statement. But in the middle of it, of course you expect censorship because of course communities are disturbed by the subversive activity um, which, which is bound to happen when humans are being genuinely human. Um, as it goes back to the temple theme, that um, the early church um, functioned as a human temple and they spoke of themselves like that. And that's very, all the controversies in Acts are about temples because they're doing a new sort of temple, which is this community. And so whether it's in Athens or in Ephesus or in Jerusalem itself, the question is, is this a counterculture? Is it going to upset our culture? And the answer is, you bet it is. So what are we going to do? Um, and so we shouldn't be surprised that we meet that. And my question would then be, how do we enable communities, schools, etc., to navigate that wisely so that the necessary offense of genuine insight is not squashed without at the same time, which is what can easily happen going the other way, just allowing any kind of trash to count as, oh, it's art, therefore it's all right because then actually you can slide very quickly down the hill into deep negativity. You hear what I'm saying? Or there's a danger, just whatever is offensive must be truer. Must be true, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is, which is which right, up. right. Yes. Um, okay, so you talked about the greatest art has always been popular and elevating, and I would love to hear more about maybe some examples of uh, more contemporary visual artists that you feel meet that criteria of being popular and elevating? Yeah, that's not my field. I imagine Jeremy may know more than I do. Um, I think a number of them are here. Yeah, uh, I will be. To take one, it's Steve Prince. I think, I think um, that can speak to many different levels and in many different ways, but in a way that is always arresting in the best sense. That will be an example to me. Uh, Roger Wagner, do you know his, Roger Wagner's work? Uh, a little, yeah. That's, extra, that's okay. extraordinary. Do we know that name? Yeah, just think the composer, but Roger, okay, rather than Richard or Ricard. <laughs> uh, his work, I think, is absolutely extraordinary. Again, this is a Christian artist, a UK artist. He writes a, a lot of biblical scenes, but in a in remarkable way. Rowan Williams has written at length oh. uh, about him as well. I'd say those, I mean, to, uh, golly, there's so many others I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think of. Um, afterwards, but those are, those are two that come to mind. I think they, the trouble is we sometimes put people like this into museums of a certain sort that you perhaps have to pay a great deal to get into, um, or put them just in flashy books that very few people are going to read, and that's, that's something we all, need, we all need to address. Thank goodness the National Gallery is still free in London, um, and and millions go in there, as you know, and spend ages in there. But many are not. Yes. Many are not. Many cathedrals now. Yeah, yeah, Neil yeah. McGregor told me there was twenty pounds to get into St Paul's or something. Twenty, goodness. It's yes. about twenty now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just uh, in case anyone worries about that, having been part of the part Sorry. of the fabric at Westminster Abbey, the one of the reasons that some cathedrals have to charge is it's the only way they can regulate the otherwise totally overwhelming That's flood of flood of tourists you know if if you have 5000 people in a building made for 2000 then everybody yeah. loses so you you have to have a way but i mean that's just a, a footnote yeah. um but but it seems to me, it's certainly in Britain over the last generation, there's been a whole movement of whether you call it young British artists or whatever, which has been um, people trying to shock, trying to say, you know, here's a pig in formaldehyde or here's um, an unmade bed or whatever. And there, I, there is, I mean, there's, there's a real examples. And the, 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 um, those are trying to say something about the negativity of the world rejecting the sentimentalism. And I, I get that, but as with most postmodern protests, once you've made your protest, the world has not changed. You know, as somebody said um, 15, 20 years ago, we've had all these years of Derrida and we still got George Bush. I mean, you know, this uh, sense of um, that the postmodern protest didn't in fact dislodge the, the narrative which was rumbling along. And I think the same, same is true in art if you're not careful. People behind? Yeah. So as a visual artist and as a preacher, I have this belief that without the arts, 
visual arts, but all the arts that institutions will die. Um, and I also have this belief that the arts have a way of, of releasing theology from its captivity behind the pulpit. Whereas preachers, we're asking, we're giving the answers and then we're telling the questions and then we're telling the answers and we're, it's stuck there. So I think the arts have the, have the um, freedom and the power to help release that. So I'm really interested in some more textual um, ideas about um, this conversation between image and imagination. And because I have this belief that institutions will die without the arts, but trying to support that. May I just want to get, please, yeah. I fully agree with you. I guess, right, I've never thought of putting it that way. Um, but my goodness, it's obvious when institutions don't take the arts seriously, uh, kind of people they become, the kind of um, structures that become prominent. Um, and so what was the other part you had mentioned the, the earlier point I was going to respond to. The real basis of my question is to to get some more language. Oh, the, yeah, the, the, the preaching. No, you know, this intuitive yeah, knowledge. I take the point about preaching. Yeah. There, very much. I get your point. And I know what you mean by a certain kind of captivity. I think, though, maybe I'll make myself unpopular or surprise some people. Um, I take preaching very, very seriously as an art form. And um, I used to teach it. And when I go to visit places, sometimes they say, oh, well, you'll need a piano and you'll need this. And you know, No, no, just, just a microphone. <laughs> oh, but we're putting you on a Sunday morning. Yes, that's right, and I'm going to preach. <laughs> and it sort of surprises people. But, um, I, I, certainly, I can't do whether I do it well, but I, I want to take it seriously. Now, that not saying that you don't, and I'm not saying that that is the be-all and end-all, but artful, Biblically grounded preaching, I think, is needed as yeah. much as anything else, yeah. along with all these other things as well. That's what I would say as well. I, I'm totally with you on that and, and uh, kind of worry about it because the, 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 the thing that we were taught, told, I was told when I got ordained, was that uh, when you study in seminary, your first papers that you write are basically sermons, and then when you get ordained, your first sermons are or basically... Essays. And, and were they essays or lectures? Or lectures, um, yes, I know. Because you're still in that mode and you have to, to figure out. And I, I've done a lot of lecturing in the last 10 years. I've done very little preaching, whereas the previous 10 years, when I was Bishop of Durham, I did an enormous amount of preaching and not nearly so much lecturing. So I've had a kind of unbalanced last two decades. And, and so I'm kind of struggling my way to find my way back in. But some of the times when I've felt it working best um, ironically, have been when I've been involved in broadcasting services where people from the BBC, for instance, will come and work with you for weeks in advance on the precise details of the service so that the sermon is calibrated with every verse of every hymn every line in every poem, the cello solo someone's going to play here, etc. And some of the producers that I've worked with just have had a much, much better instinct than almost any clergy I've known for what will work aesthetically for the, the whole experience, in the middle of which, when you're then preaching, there is a sense of wholeness, of resonance, yeah. instead of it being, there's the rest of the service doing its thing, and then here's the sermon, bang. Um, and obviously, because I've done a lot of guest preaching, it's very hard, going around from churches. It's very hard to do that because you're not involved in all the uh, in all the detail of the preparation. But it can be done. And I remember when I was dean of Litchfield, and we we did some broadcasts w which generated that experience. We looked at one another afterwards. We said, you know, we should be much more intentional about all the details of our preparation because the totality of the service everything together isn't it? Yeah. actually works yeah, in such a rich way. That, that question was terrific. Thank you. One more. Thanks. The uh, thinking in terms of the Platonism of the American church, especially the art that I was raised with, whether in children's books or comics, always ended with a light that never illumined anything. There was always a sort of burst of light at the end of the comic or at the end of the, of the book, which gave us the new creation, but you couldn't see anything. <laughs> you just see this big burst of light. I'm wondering if you can help us with resources, uh, not just from the present, but from the past, moments when you think theology and, art and the arts find the new creation in a dynamic, eloquent, and, and powerful way. Places that you would point us to to go find an exemplar where this, this is how you do the expression of the new creation. 
There are no doubt a thousand, and Jeremy will know much better than me, but because I tend to fill silences with, with words, um, <laughs> uh, um, my mind goes straight to Bach's Christmas Oratorio and the opening thereof. Uh, I just think it's just such an astonishing shout of praise and joy and, and surprise, actually, that such a thing should happen. And the moments like that... Um, so many examples. If you're, you're a particular artworks or pieces, is that what you're looking at? Well, or particularly the, 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 con, the confluence of, of theology and the arts. Is there a moment in, in the history of the tradition in which oh, these two things come together and, and that we kind of get this right? Well, I think there are a lot of places. I think there, um, there's a huge amount of American music. I mean, obviously the spiritual tradition, all that early jazz, well, late jazz actually as well. Some, um, oh gosh. I can leave 100 and certain, I mean, it's funny to keep going back to, to Bach, but he has the same initials as me, so I have a special fondness for him. Um, I just think, I think he's the, uh, the Christian musician. It doesn't mean we all ought to be, you know, composing like Bach now. Right? That, of course, that's ridiculous. I think I've learned more from Bach than any other Christian musician. And he really is biblical and theological. I think that's where it happens. And it happens without him making great fuss about it. He couldn't write prose very well. They used to tease him because his letters were awful. <laughs> it's lovely to think that someone could do all that, but actually he's very clumsy with words. He wasn't clumsy understanding words or understanding biblical words in particular. He was totally immersed in the Bible. So I think that, yeah, that would be an example. Um, oh, but there's so many others, so many others. I think we'd have to, I'm afraid, Tom, I'm going to one more question from you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this um, conversation. And just in Reverend Wright's uh, brief reference to Damien Hurst, this popped up oh, yeah. in my mind. Um, I, I see a little bit more redemption in some of what Hurst actually does. But um, just I'm noticing, and this has just been such a rich time this weekend, but one thing that I haven't um, heard a lot about is engaging with the arts, maybe the prophetic impulse in the work of artists who aren't Christians. <laughs> and in my experience, and I'm a, I'm a literary scholar, in my experience, some of the um, contemporary writers and even some contemporary popular musicians, yeah. I'm seeing some uh, maybe incredible common grace insights and prophetic truths from yeah. non-Christians, maybe even more than some of the Christians that are in the arts. And that might be because, you know, we've already mentioned um, within the church, how the arts are sometimes pushed down. You know, Christian artists don't have that support. So I just wanted you to maybe speak Great. to oh, very good. that role. Very good. I, I, I didn't name Hurst as such, but obviously I was referring to that movement that he's part of, and I'm not an expert in that at all. I merely like the general drift of the unwashed British public. I see it in the newspapers <laughs> and, uh, you know, aware of a phenomenon there um, and think, what's going on here? Um, but um, As opposed to America, where they wash well, is that right, do you think? <laughs> The, the sheets there, are always clean. There were no implied contrasts there at all. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, but, but yes, I, and I think the church at its best has always recognized that there are astonishing, profound insights arising from different movements, artistic and literary, etc., that are themselves outside the church. I mean, that, I, I don't have any problem with that at all. And whether one wants to put the label of common grace, which is a kind of an older theological label on that, or something else, I don't much mind. Um, because I think with St. Paul, um, all truth is God's truth, and uh, Paul talks about taking every thought captive to, to obey the Messiah, um, and captive may be, may be too much in that context, but want to say there may be profound insight there, and it may be profound insight which the church has insulated itself against for whatever reasons of fear or, or whatever, protectiveness. Um, and that some people, some of the time within the church, have to open themselves to those insights without thereby collapsing into that sort of pantheism which says, oh well, uh, or, which then results in the elevation of the artist as though the artist is somehow automatically inspired. And obviously, ever since the Romantic movement particularly, that's been a danger yeah. um, of, of people, what's the usual mantra, of replacing the sacred with the sublime. Yeah. Um, and, and then the sublime, uh, we, we have 
and, and this goes with the contemporary movement which says, I'm not religious, but I am deeply spiritual. You know, in other words, I don't go to church, but, but I have many dimensions to my life. And that could only be seen as a commendation within an Epicurean world which had become the either or. And so we're in a cultural muddle right now, and I suspect you know, we always have been, probably. But in the middle of that, yes, we thank God for every good and perfect gift, wherever it comes from, and then we take every thought captive to obey the Messiah. Yeah, just to respond to that, th a terrific question. I was actually reflecting that most of my work in, in the musical field is, is amongst non-Christians, and most of the music I play and study and read about is actually not by Christians at all. Um, but of course, I'm, I believe in, I prefer the cat run and common great, just the work of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Uh, I believe the Holy Spirit can take these and do extraordinary things with them. Otherwise, I wouldn't play. I don't know, Beethoven, Brahms, or, or whoever. Um, I teach quite a bit in the music department in, in Cambridge amongst people who can really be quite hostile to Christian faith, but I find they can nevertheless, um, they don't articulate it in theological language quite, but they speak about music in ways which are redolent uh, theologically. And out of that extraordinary conversations Extraordinary conversations I've had. An, an example I often use is there's a very famous, I would not mention his name if this is recorded, uh, music professor who was at Cambridge many, a very, very frightening figure, a composer. Uh, I was terrified of meeting him, and, but he was doing a lecture on an atheist, a vigorous atheist, um, a lecture on, on uh, relig music and religion in Japan. It, it, he, the lecture was in Japan, but it was on music and religion. And he's, he came to see me because he'd heard I'd sort of dabbled in that area. <laughs> so, so we met, and I was, I mean, literally, I think I was trembling, because the guy, right, I mean, he's, he's fierce, absolutely fierce. And very early on in the conversation, we kind of trundled, where we kind of, you know, like dogs sniffing each other. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then I say, because one of the interesting things was just what you mentioned earlier, Tom, the interesting thing to do with music is you can combine sounds in the same oral space. Um, and if you have three of those sounds, you can begin to see, and he said, that, that, that trinity thing, is that right? <laughs> Funny you should say that, I said. <laughs> and we then talked about the trinity and about the love of God for maybe a quarter of an hour. Now, books and apologetics and how to share your faith with your non-Christian friend will not tell you to talk about the trinity, right? But through music, that was an extraordinary conversation. Um, and I learned a great deal for him from as well. It's not just we just kind of unload doctrine on him. Um, but. <laughs> I learned a great deal because, of course, I had to re-articulate things and therefore rethink things really quite drastically in the light of, with, in conversation with this incredibly intelligent person. Now, that's an example within the so-called classical world, but it could actually apply in any kind of music. You could do that as well. Tom, I think we need to get away. I've got to rehearse the brass and you need to preach, and I think those are not the same things. Anyhow, um, could, you, oh. could you introduce Herbert and well, say a bit about this wonderful poem? Jeremy's asked me to read one of the mystical songs that, that I learned when I was a teenager. And this is a poem by George Herbert. And it's, uh, the title of the poem is simply Easter. Yep. And it's, it's um, uh, picking up the beauty of this world and saying, um, but actually Easter is like that only a thousand times more. Anyway, Herbert can say it better than I can. I got me flowers to straw thy way. I got me boughs off many a tree. But thou wast up by break of day, and broughtst thy sweets along with thee. The sun arising in the east, though he give light and the east perfume, if they should offer to contest with thy arising, they presume. Can there be any day but this, though many suns to shine endeavor? We count three hundred, but we miss. There is but one and that one ever. Yes, Amen. Tom, thank you so much from us all. It's thank been you. wonderful. Thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs> thank you.